Well, thank you very much, Thurston, for a, a really uh, vibrant start to things, and I, and I think a lot of areas for discussion. Um, as I said, I'd like to turn, if I could, uh, again, the biographies are um, on your seats, but uh, we have uh, John Authors and Barbara Ridpath joining us up here. Um, John, could I turn to you and uh, ask you to maybe make a quick comment or two on, on Thurston's presentation, please? Well, a very quick comment is that it was a very impressive presentation, which told me a lot of things I didn't know. It's a very difficult, very diaphanous concept to measure. Uh, there's plainly something out there to be measured, and that this is the most interesting attempt I've yet seen to try to measure it. Uh, I can't greatly disagree from the uh, broad sweep of the, of, the, uh, of the conclusions either. I suppose if there's one point I'd particularly like to make, and uh, Michael told me that I should not be embarrassed about blowing my own trumpet ass, a point I made in this book, it's still available on amazon.co.uk. Um, any kind of innovation has to be uh, viewed in the financial sphere, sphere through uh, the, the, the prism, the focus of how it uh, moves through human nature, because it's in human nature that uh, bubbles are created, that misallocations of capital happen. Uh, if uh, a financial innovation is such that it leads to overconfidence in those people working in uh, in the industry, if it leads to a splitting between the interests of the principal and the agent so that uh, institutional imperatives become more important rather than the interests of the people ultimately holding the money, then uh, overconfidence can become a serious problem. Now, given that we're all thinking uh, quite a bit about speeding offences at the moment for one reason or another, you could draw the analogy of uh, you could give an extremely a state-of-the-art um, racing car to uh, a testosterone-fueled young man if you felt like it, uh, and it would be very easy to control, and the risks would be very great that once uh, behind the wheel, people would begin to get overconfident and start to do things that are very dangerous. For that reason, in general, this is why we have a rule of law. You put very strong um, incentives, or rather disincentives, towards speeding towards behaving dangerously on the people who are behind the wheel of a new and powerful instrument. We failed miserably to do that in the case of, um, of uh, those who were entrusted with uh, uh, financial innovations such as CDOs, CDO squareds, super sieves, uh, and so on. One final meta point within, within this, so basically the, the critical the critical question on innovation is how it's going to be dealt with by human beings. Can it be road tested for being dealt with by human beings? Finally, if there's one area of finance we do need to look at and which is perhaps uh, neglected relative to others, it's not banking and the sell side, it's the buy side, because it's the buy side where, uh, which is a much uh, more recent beast. Uh, really, institutional investment management has not been with us any more than two generations at most. Banking has been around very much longer than that. And the incentives uh, on the buy side, I would argue, are particularly skewed. Uh, your average in, uh, investment manager is being incentivized to accumulate assets rather than to uh, allocate capital in any particular way or to beat the market or anything like that. Uh, there's a lot of very valuable financial innovation going on in the buy side. I spend a lot of time writing about it, but it ain't going to work unless we have, uh, unless the industry is structured properly, and unless the incentives uh, on the uh, people who are actually operating those innovations are got right. And that will, as was, is evidently the case, can only come through an appropriate regulatory framework. John, thank, thank you very was much. Was that a, a, that was a absolutely perfect? Yeah. Um, Barbara, could I, could I have you, could you give us your tuppence worth sure, before we get cracking? Sure, and I will do, it's, it's a good split because I'll do a little bit more of the sell side. Um, first of all, I welcome the research that's being done. There is a lot more research needed in this area, and I couldn't agree more, although it is hard to find some of the data to do it. Um, I'm going to draw on something I read from McKinsey in the 1980s that argued that the benefits of investment in R&D in financial innovation are actually very low relative to other industries because they can rarely patent or trademark what they do. And so the benefit drops very quickly because everybody rushes into the market 
almost simultaneously. So, so the comparison between manufacturing industries, I mean, the service industry is fair, but the manufacturing industry is a little bit of a spurious um, comparison. So you get these first mover profits. And what does that mean? The first mover profits mean that, first of all, you get relatively low investment, and you, ex- and you don't get this right to exploit the product in a protected environment for a period of time. So you get this volume issue that comes up in new products and finance in a way it doesn't in other industries to take rapid advantage. And you get this herd mentality that everybody mentions, and then the former home of Merrill Lynch that was um, the thundering herd. Um, It couldn't be a more perfect analogy. Um, And you get really rapid and often uncontrolled growth and uncontrolled mutation. And as a result, what you really need to investigate is how you can safely experiment and how you can control experimentation. And there, so you see the second order effects, so you see the unintended consequences of a new product, and particularly of volumes, rapid volumes of a new product. And there I would think of the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, or I would think of testing new airplanes before they let us fly on them, for which I am very grateful, um, and how you get this new regulatory framework particularly for the financial stability regulators and for shadow banking, to find a way to experiment with these new products so you don't lose the innovation before they go to the volumes that the sieves did. And it was the volume of the sieves that killed us. It wasn't the sieve per se. It was the the, the way they took off with such rapid, explosive growth that no regulator had a right to control. Except the Spanish. I would say the Spanish did that very well. So I would just conclude that, you know, I'd like to stop the sort of Luddite inclination to think post the financial crisis that all innovation is bad. We really need innovation in finance, as we do in all other products and services, if we're going to progress. And there are lots of examples of good innovation, microfinance, commercial paper 100 years ago, securitization in the United States in the 70s and 80s pre-subprime made home ownership a reality in the US and the UK for, for a huge percentage of the population that wouldn't have had it otherwise. But let's stop calling regulatory arbitrage innovation. <laughs> well, thank you both. Um, what we'll do is, if we can, we'll try and get to get our community talking to us. So um, there are some microphones in the audience. I'd like shows of hands from people who'd like to make some comments. Gentlemen there, Lauren, if you don't mind. Um, sir. And please just state you know, who you are, any affiliation you'd like to have known. Yeah, Sean Glasgow, I'm working on setting up an advisory ostinato. Uh, very interesting, I think, um, the, the presentation. And I actually started on Wall Street in the 80s, a couple years before 1987. So it was the Volcker years, and very much was raised by my econ professor to have a lot of respect for the sobriety of the Bundesbank. In 1987, we had portfolio insurance as a big contribution to the crash. At that point, Greenspan put gas in the tank. And we had the same thing in 1998. How much is it that we're doing this innovation around trying to control markets and then the central bank policy is just acerbating it and encouraging innovation that does not really help end investors. Okay, so rule of central bank. Gentleman there, behind you, Lauren. Hold your hand up so we get, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Nigel White. I used to work in finance for 20 odd years and currently, uh, amongst other things, a pension fund trustee. My question is, um, I was waking up this morning about six o'clock and because I was waking up, I got some of the details wrong and listening to the day program on Radio 4. And there's an interview with Carol Sargent, ex of the FSA and Lloyds Bank, uh, announcing the launch of some British Standard Institute kite marks for financial products. And these were so-called simple financial products. And she was proudly proclaiming, no matter which bank you bought a kite mark product from, it would behave in exactly the same way. Does the, the panel think that uh, that's actually a financial innovation or a financial anti-innovation? And if it is an innovation, is it good, bad, or ugly? <laughs> Thank you. And uh, one more from over here in the front. 
So it's Steve Podmore of Transform Capital Management. Um, I'm just interested to link uh, what Michael talked about uh, with diversity in the economy um, to, to um, your uh, view, Tarsten, of um, positive versus negative financial innovation. Um, we need capital to go to the, the, the plankton of our economic food chain, the real economy. Uh, and to what extent do you believe we've failed to address these things that are longer term, need uh, lower cost access to capital with added value, help and support that the early stage businesses that that money needs to reach need? And just bringing it back to the real big issues, how do we factor this in in relation to climate uh, climate change, sustainable development, and these big issues that we're not pricing in. So we need risk uh, innovation to, to address these time factors, and we need capital go to the real economy to, uh, to, to stimulate the right kind of growth. Um, have we failed and what can we do? Okay. Well, three questions. So the, the relationship between uh, central banking and money, um, standards, I'll, I'll actually tackle that if I may uh, briefly, uh, and then how do we connect with the real economy? Uh, the reason I say I just tackle that is I happen to be on the board of UCAS, the accreditation service, so we're the regulator of the BSI. Uh, and we've been supporting an initiative called Fair Banking, which is a kite marking initiative for products. I'm not sure if that's exactly the same one that was referred to on the program as I, as I didn't hear the program. Um, however, um, I think it's a bit of a misnomer. Standards, oddly, perversely, aren't about strict identity between products. They're about the process meeting the purpose to which it's intended. Um, and so I'm a little surprised if, if that's what she was saying, but I'm sure the other panelists will have thoughts as well. Thurston, you've been getting some feedback here. Okay. Would you like to tackle one or two of these? Yes, let me actually actually uh, uh, re uh, respond both to John and uh, one of the uh, comment, I think the first commentator. Um, um, yes, how does innovation relate to human nature? And uh, uh, it can uh, foster or it can combine with overconfidence into, into crashes, basically. Um, and I think this relates directly to the, the macroeconomic framework and the regulatory framework, which might actually um, foster this kind of uh, becoming too overconfident and using financial innovation uh, towards overexpansion. I think that's what we've exactly seen over the last 20 years. I mean, that's why people talk about the, uh, the Greenspan Bernanke put, um, um, putting too much uh, fuel into the gas um, tank, um, or about um, 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 the, combining the, the political uh, aim of uh, getting everybody his own house in the U.S. Uh, with an overexpansion and uh, lowering of uh, lending standards in, in housing finance, which ultimately contributed uh, uh, to raise this uh, financial innovation of uh, subprime mortgages, which seemed a very, uh, very nice way of uh, getting people into houses. But of course, uh, it was a one-way bet uh, to for. Uh, always increasing uh, house price and obviously as we know it went, uh, it went wrong so I think there is um, um, maybe uh, uh, come back to a point that I've made in other contexts but it's financial innovation is not something good or bad it's really it depends on the, the regulatory framework the macroeconomic framework and the political framework in which it actually happens um, yes yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to talk on the standards um, on the uh, competition um, so I think, um, I mean, this is a little bit of a, a very tricky issue. Um, and I think uh, here, um, yes, I think fostering diversity in the, in the financial system, so looking beyond the, the banking system, I think that's the, the, the most important one. Um, actually, coming from, looking at it from continental Europe, I, I've always been under the impression that the UK is actually doing better in this, in this sense in terms of non-bank financial uh, sources uh, uh, for entrepreneurs and for SMEs in continental Europe where we barely have any venture capital or any angel finance. And of course everybody here in Europe, including the UK, looks towards the US where this um, exists even more. Um, of course we also know that during the crisis um, uh, there is always a retrenchment um, of, uh, of finance um, and of course the ones to be heard most are the, uh, are the SMEs, so that's not, uh, um, not, very, uh, not very surprising to, to, to see. Um, Again, I think um, a focus on, uh, and again, I mean, this is a very general comment, but uh, focusing on competition, trying to bring in new players, um, maybe also even with some support uh, um, uh, from the government, uh, not uh, the government um, trying to distribute loans itself, but uh, providing maybe incentives or certain funds uh, to do so, um, that might be also helpful in this context. I'm, I'm actually 
actually slightly more optimistic on the funds the SMEs. I think we all have to remember that maybe outside the Mittelstand in Germany, you know, 20 years ago, nobody lent to SMEs either. You know, <laughs> people never lend to SMEs. It's a myth. Um, and we need to find ways to do it. We need to find good ways to do it. But I think there's a lot going on in innovation in B2B lending, in the supplier finance that many of the corporates that can now borrow cheaper than the banks are doing, where they're actually funding the buyers of their merchandise or the buyers of their services to be able to do that. And in the market, you know, whether it's in a revision of, because I'm about to use a three-letter word, the CLO market for small business loans in packaging them with enough statistical diversity that you can actually use that method very effectively for small business finance. Um, I think innovation is really all around and I think we don't want to go back to a UK where you allocate credit by sector as it was before, you know, pre-Big Bang. Um, I, can, I can agree with that. I, I would make one point that I, always makes me nervous when, when it gives the, you're quite right, the problem of uh, lending to smaller companies is, a, is an eternal one. We want it to happen, but it's risky and it's hard work. Um, there is always a danger that uh, I, I think that, that particularly the junk bond wave was, was about a sense that there was safety in numbers. If you just lent enough money out there, uh, enough of you know, the portfolio effect would be on your on your side. Enough of the loans would be okay that it didn't matter that you uh, no, that you hadn't done all the due diligence. The due diligence would become would come purely as part of the, uh, the the sheer volume of what you did. Now there was always an element of a fallacy to that, and then we came up against that fallacy a generation later with subprime lending in an even greater and more damaging than way than, than with the uh, loans in the 80s. So again, one has to be, I, I can agree, but I'm, I, I, I still feel intuitively like I want to be very conservative about seeing the way in which those non-traditional bank structures begin to uh, go about making those lendings. In terms of the Greenspan put, uh, the Bernanke put uh, arguments, um, uh, I'm not sure that the, the, the Greenspan response to, to, uh, to Black Monday was necessarily so damaging. You, you had the, the you, you know, triggered a bear market in bonds in, in 94. The point that I started covering Wall Street in 96, he was still regarded as, 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 uh, as, a, uh, as a hawkish, tough uh, central banker. Certainly, uh, I would completely agree that after, from 98 onwards, however, the perception uh, of, a, of a Greenspan put was total uh, and was justified and did have uh, a, a big impact on financial institutions' behavior. If you, if you had taken a look at financial institutions' share prices compared to the market as a whole, it's after, after LTCM that you see them start to rise. Um, if you had taken a look, it was quite interesting, if you looked at Thorsten's own uh, uh, rather interesting diagram of, uh, of financial innovation, you see it starts to rise quite interestingly. Uh, at about that, um, at about that point, uh, uh, and I have a chart which I often show on presentations. If you have a look at the Fed funds rate starting in '98 and carry on through to the crisis in 2008 on one scale, uh, and you have a look at the S&P 500 on the other scale, you can barely tell the difference between them. It looks, to all intents and purposes, as though um, as though uh, the Fed was being guided in its interest rate policy solely by the, the level of the stock market. If shares were going up, it was OK for, for interest rates to rise. If shares were coming down, then interest rates had to be cut. Um, so uh, in a sort of curmudgeonly way, yes, if you can allow a lot more innovation to happen uh, and you can let a thousand flowers bloom, providing you're not giving them, a, I suppose we could come back to the racing car analogy, providing you're not letting them have the punch bowl. The problem we are in at the moment, of course, is that for the foreseeable future, markets are being given large, regular inoculations of punch, mm -hmm. whether they want it or not. Um, and it will be a while before we can get away from that, which makes it that much more difficult to feel confident about new forms of financial innovation, unless we're going to be uh, very paternalistic about the way we regulate it. 
John, you, you got me thinking. I almost want to go home and look at another graph, which is to contrast money supply. If there's more money sloshing about, there's more to innovate with. You know, it's a, that's true. And that, uh, but there's also some yes, yeah. there's some very interesting uh, well, charts there. When we were chatting uh, beforehand, you raised the quiet period in the states, and I was just wondering if you might explain that to the audience briefly and how Thurston's presentation uh, affected your thoughts on that. Well, the the, the notion of the quiet period is um, comes from. Uh, it's not my idea, my phrase, it's from Gary Gorton of Yale um, School of Management, uh, who's, uh, um, his point, um, he's written, written a couple of very interesting books about the crisis. One of them, very impressively, was published just before the crisis. Um, uh, and he was making the point that um, what is most dangerous about, uh, about the financial system is the, is the potential for a bank run. Uh, and the big anomalous period in American financial he history is the period from the mid-30s through to quite recently when suddenly we didn't have bank runs. Uh, I mean, there was the occasional bank run in Victorian Britain, but in the States it was an absolute, once, you know, regular as clockwork, once in a generation there was a huge bank run. Um, and it was only with uh, the institution of Glass-Steagall, with uh, the, the creation of the FDIC, uh, the very, very conservative rules on how big banks could be allowed to become that you entered a quiet period when the banking system did actually uh, rather boringly do what it was supposed to do and became a rather less innovative place. During that period, you had uh, uh, much, you know, generally not growth that wasn't as exciting as it would be uh, starting in the 80s once innovation started taking off again, but you also had, generally speaking, much less volatility. Um, and the basic point that it's bank runs that most matter to us continues to be the case. The, the, the moment when Lehman became Lehman with a capital L and quotes around it was when, uh, was when the Reserve Fund broke the buck because of it two days later. Uh, and then that was, for me, that was the moment when all hell very nearly did break loose and it was very obvious that many people seriously could imagine the whole payment system breaking down. That was because, what happened with, that was because of a bank run in the money market fund sector. I'd like to take some comments maybe from the middle. We've taken a few from up forward. So the gentleman there on the aisle on the right. Uh, Paul Whitaker, regulatory training consultant. It strikes me that one of the major problems in terms of innovation is it's often shorthand for um, opaque financial products or tax efficient investment, both ways in which you have either a transfer of risk from bank to customer or um, revenue removed from government. And I was interested in the panel's views on the asymmetry of information between the two. Okay. A hand over there on the left. Sorry. The gentleman standing there. Thank you. My name is David G. I'm Senior Advisor on Science Policy and Emerging Issues for the European Environment Agency, which is based in Copenhagen. And I wanted to make a comment and then two questions, really. The comment from our sector, we see quite strong empirical evidence that smart regulation and well-designed taxation on pollution and inefficient use of resources stimulates innovation rather well. And the work of Michael Porter at MIT in his famous 95 paper and his 20-year follow-up, plus the work of Ashford at MIT now, clearly shows that and our own reports on the link between market prices and innovation. The two sets of questions, in our other piece of work, to do with late lessons from early warnings, which has been a 10-year project, uh, two volumes, looking at 30 case studies where long-term benefits did not come from very short-term beneficial technologies and innovations. We identified 12 causes um, which are extremely similar to those in the ecosystems crisis right now and in the energy climate change crisis. And four or five of them have been mentioned from the front. Misaligned incentives, um, growth that is too fast for people, in particular regulators, to keep up with, misplaced faith in models. But the two I want to focus on and ask a question about were mentioned in both uh, speakers. The first is market prices that do not reflect full costs, full risks, and so on, which is across the three sectors that I talk about and is a real large market failure. And the second, sort of related but not quite, the huge external costs that are externalized from the sectors 
onto the rest of society, something that Mervyn King drew attention to. How would the panelists deal with these issues of in, in, uh, sort of uh, false market prices, really, for products and huge implicit subsidies from externalities? But finally, Michael, your own lovely piece on systems view of the credit crunch, you end with four or five questions, key questions, which haven't been addressed. If I could just quickly mention three of them. The first one you say is... Well, as long as it's is, a distinguished author, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Is, um, does society overvalue size and economies of scale, both within financial sectors and other sectors? Secondly, you say, should regulators, or regulations rather, be limited by what regulators can reasonably understand? Which is a good question. Uh, the third one is, how can we promote fast, efficient procedures for both bankruptcy and for judicial redress? So those might be interesting questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. One last comment from the middle. Anyone? That, oh, right, right in front of you, James, Jan Peter. Jan Peter, Hans uh, risk manager both in banking and in the past in commodity trading. I'm curious what you think about the sources of demand for financial innovation, because in most companies or services, you can be tremendously innovative and come up with brilliant new products and services, but if nobody buys them, they tend to not have much of an impact in the world. That's not been the case in finance, so what about the demand side for all this financial innovation? Thank you. So sources of demand, um, taking full account of costs uh, and externalities and opacity and tax. Um, who'd like to kick off? Mm. Well, let me actually start with the last one on demand, um, and I think um, Maybe this is another way to distinguish uh, between different kinds of financial innovation. Um, that where um, there is demand, um, for example, because we want to reach out to SMEs, so we need new lending technologies, or um, we know that only 20% of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa have access to an account, and then we need new delivery channels. So there is a latent demand for vi commercially viable financial services or financial innovation, uh, where basically the supply creates its own demands um, by, for example, mis-selling. Um, so maybe that's another way just to distinguish it. Um, so, but I think there is demand uh, for, the, for innovation. Um, um, but again, there's also innovation which maybe there is not uh, uh, demand, at least not demand as we would like to see it. Um, which brings me to the, 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 actually the first question on um, um, these uh, tax uh, innovation being equal, equalized with uh, tax efficient products or whatever, opaque products. Um, I mean, that's exactly the, the kind of innovation, I guess, that, um, that is not really part of the intermediation view as I um, uh, espoused them at the very end of my presentation. Uh, so that's um, what I was saying. Maybe when we talk about uh, the financial sector, let's try to go back to the intermediation function of the financial sector, not uh, uh, creating uh, products that just help people uh, evade taxes or um, do other things to, to get around uh, regulatory or government uh, um, uh, regulation or laws. Um, the taxation, um, um, I mean, that's, um, that's a whole other panel discussion, I think, when we talk about uh, smart taxation in the financial system. I think the financial transaction tax is being discussed in uh, what's well, almost uh, through now, I guess, in the European Union. It's definitely not a smart way of taxing the financial sector. I think the financial sector should be taxed more, but not in this way where the incident ultimate, ultimately ends up on the customer, but rather in a way that you can actually influence the risk-taking um, um, of bankers and I think, uh, or of investors, and uh, I think there, is, uh, there are better ways uh, to do that, and they have been already suggested, but uh, I guess for politicians it's easier to go for a simple solution such as the um, transaction tax. Um, and I think the last uh, comment um, uh, on uh, the um, market prices don't reflect risk and the externalities that come from bank failure or for financial fragility, I think these go hand in hand. Uh, market prices don't reflect risk. Why, again? Because it's uh, heads I win, tails you lose. Uh, privatizing uh, profits and socializing losses. And that's why these uh, prices don't reflect uh, uh, properly the risk. And uh, um, if they don't take into account the externalities that come uh, from, um, uh, from a, a failing bank or failing financial institutions. Um, which brings me back to the last point you made about resolution. I think um, if we can properly, and I think there's no perfect way to do this, but if we can, we really should focus on the resolution framework uh, because if people know the end game, they know what will happen if things go wrong in terms of how much they will get back or how much they have to pay, this will also influence the incentives uh, during uh, the, the, the normal times. Um, um, and I think this might actually be a more um, important part of the overall regulatory framework than um, 
this whole fine-tuning of capital requirements, risk rates, liquidity requirements here and there, which is also important, um, but might not change incentives as much as the focus on, uh, on the res resolution uh, framework. Um, one last point. Um, um, size is not necessarily good, but size doesn't have to be bad. I mean, it were, we're not just large financial institutions that failed, there were also a couple of small financial institutions. Uh, so the German I IKB wasn't really a big institution. Uh, I guess Northern Rock is also not that big. Um, SNL uh, crisis in the US, lots of small institutions. Um, so it's not necessarily about size, it might actually be more about the complexity. Um, and actually, coming back to the resolution, if you force banks to become less complex, for example, through these living wills, these uh, um, uh, recovery plans, um, resolution recovery plans, and actually that might ultimately help, again, the incentives going into it, into the in normal times. If I may, I'm, I'm going to focus on the sources of demand because I think that's really important and it relates to several of the other questions were raised and even the kite marks, which is that what we are hopefully seeing, but I am an eternal optimist, is a return to client centricity and client service. Where many of the problems that built up in the sector came from is serving the shareholders of the banks and not serving the clients of the banks. And no industry proffers if it's not serving its clients well. So there were products that were very clearly designed. A lot of the Forex, a lot of the derivatives actually helped corporate clients manage their risk better. But you get to the perverse extreme and you have the current review of interest rate swaps in this country where SMEs were sold knockout swaps that they cannot pay now that interest rates have dropped, that were pointless things that should never have been sold. You know, so you really need to keep turning the focus on what is right for the client and what does the client need at every step of the process. And then you get back to a much saner system and you get back to an innovation that actually benefits the client. I mean, the whole reason for the retail distribution review in this country is because IFAs were abusing clients in many instances and were selling products the client would never understand, and several of the IFAs didn't understand either. Um, and I think in that way, if you can pull back some of that, that's why you get to this first round question, which was the kite marks. You know, you want some very simple products that someone without a PhD in finance can understand and put their savings into. It's kind of interesting, actually, because you're almost looking at tax as a supply of demand to the previous question. John, did you want to comment particularly on the buy side element that oh, yes. Barbara was touching on, which you raised earlier? Yeah, I, I, think, I think if there's a source of demand for, um, uh, for innovation for new products, it comes from this big demographic problem that gets hyped up in any number of different ways. There are that many more... Uh, retired people coming, uh, who are go people who are going to want to retire before too much longer, uh, and a lot of the assumptions they had built on uh, how much they were going to have to retire on are now looking very ropey. There is a, a very great need to come up with new innovative products to somehow or other take the resources we've got and spread them around, build them in a way that fairly uh, makes sure that, that, that people provide for themselves in their retirement. Now, that's a huge uh, source of demand uh, and uh, in terms of the, the, the point about um, financial innovation, obviously a lot of financial innovation is just uh, horrible obfuscation and, uh, and trickery. Not all of it, but a lot of it. No, no, no possible denying that point. But what is interesting to me is that um, if you do look at the buy side, if you look at people trying to deal with this essential problem of uh, how do we actually manage husband resources in a way that we can actually uh, deliver a good deal to people? There is a lot of there. Just in the time that I've been covering fund management, which is somewhat a bit over twenty years now, that there has been a lot of innovation. There is a lot of understanding that, that there is a broader understanding now that uh, that it's very difficult to beat the market. That um, a broadly diversified um, fund that uh, that charges active management fees in an attempt to break, beat the market is a complete, um, completely unjustifiable vehicle these days that people have worked out how to do indexing. Now they're working out how to do uh, more interesting forms of passive investment that, that can in some defensible way attempt to beat the market while not 
charging too much. Now, those are all um, ultimately very good innovations in a, in a way that might lead to retirement funds being husbanded better. Um, but everything still comes down to the incentives, the structure through which, uh, the, uh, through which they're sold, through which people will try to operate them. To give you an extremely current uh, example, um, uh, I've spent most of my career in the States um, in all due deference to the Thundering Herd. I used to think the Thundering Herd, um, the, Merrill, the Merrill Lynch sales force, was a, was a fairly aggressive sales body. If you compare the, the level of discourse in the States with what, what one might get from an IFA in this country, it is humiliatingly embarrassing for anybody British. The, the, level, of the level of advice, the quality of advice that people receive in this country is a scandal. Um, what I discovered, I, 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 I've got a small child at home, so my, my parents want to put up a trust fund for him. They just leave it to me as the, the alleged expert on investment to, to choose what to put it in. So I have all these bright ideas for, for uh, um, fundamental, fundamentally indexed um, funds that, 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 go for, that, that systematically uh, emphasize companies with high dividend yields and low, ETF, low, low PEs and all that kind of, all that kind of thing. Uh, and then I discover that the, uh, the only funds that, where you can get these funds in, in this country is with remarkably big sales loads that aren't, don't apply in the States, that they're only available as ETFs, not as mutual funds, that there's no way of buying them with a regular, regular contribution. It's, it's just quite astonishing that there might be a lot of innovation going out there, but if it's funneled through a, a poorly regulated, poorly educated, poorly trained distribution force, it's not going to help anybody. Yeah, that's, um, that's kind of a... That Coco began to get passionate there, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I, it reminds me very much of Coco Chanel, who apparently said, you know, innovation, innovation, I've had enough of innovation, I want to make classics. So we, we need these sorts of classic investment vehicles. Um, we have time for just two very quick comments from the back, if I might. So, James, if there's, anybody wants to kick in, because we're just coming close to time. Gentleman there. Um, Sandy Canera, um, Gresham College devotee. I was interested in the comment about the, uh, the credit being given to lower, um, people with lower, lower status, and tying that in with the uh, death of money that's coming out of the banks to small businesses. Why can't the techniques being used by the payday lenders to grant loans quickly in hours and minutes rather than days and months and almost years of the big banks. Why can't these techniques be used by the big banks, the, the high street banks, to make credit more quickly available? Thank you. Anybody else? Last one? Great. Um, oh, actually, sorry, all the way to the front, our host, Matt. A Merrill Lynch employee, um, th there's a very small compliment there, so thank you for that. Um, <laughs> not what I want to say. Um, I just wonder whether we might move slightly the angle of what we mean by financial innovation to what I think is part of the new paradigm, which is not so much coming up with clever ideas within institutions, but working collectively in, in, in better ways. Mm. And that kind of addresses some of the qu questions about how do you fully priced transactions and so on. I think, I think some of the newer innovations are sort of the social finance structures that are being put together, the working between government and, and banks or companies and, uh, and NGOs. And, and, th and that sort of dialogue, I think, is something that, that is a healthy... I don't know whether it can even be picked up in the, in the modeling that can be done, but I think that, that type of in innovation is, is, in terms of long finance, that's probably the direction we need to go if you want to try to bring in more of these externalities. Quick comments? I'll take on the payday lenders because the reason that the payday lenders can do what they do is the usurious interest rates that the banks are not allowed to charge by law. Um, so um, I would not use a payday lender model for any kind of um, quality credit distribution, and I'm very pleased to see the OFT going after them. <laughs> No, I perfectly agree with uh, Barbara. I mean, uh, uh, of course, even if it were legal, I mean, the reason why payday lender can do it in one day or in one, a couple of minutes is because uh, they, they charge exactly these interest rates. So um, uh, even if they, they lose out on the 20, 30 percent of the clients, they still make, make enough money. And uh, so I don't think that's a model to be uh, followed. On the other hand, I mean, there are 
possibility for banks to make lending decisions much faster. Maybe, maybe there is more in uh, competition needed to actually um, uh, for them to become more efficient. So I think there's um, there's an, uh, there's, a, there's a side to this argument. Yes. I'd like to uh, close, if I might, on a question, a chairman's question to the three of you. We, we're talking here about innovation and regulation. Um, Thurston, you emphasize the ability of the regulators to learn. Barbara, you threw in the regulatory arbitrage kind of element. But uh, what's wrong with competition amongst regulators? Is that not the way that regulators learn? Is that not the way that we learn what works? I mean, my, my contention is, you know, during the financial crisis, we went and we learned actually some things. So you raised Spain, for example which we wouldn't have learned in a homogenized regulatory area. So I'd be kind of curious on thoughts about that before we close. Can I ask um, you, John? Well, Spain, very ironically, um, kept its banks from getting involved in, um, in supercivery and uh, would actually put limits on BBVA and Santander from over-expanding overseas, which is all very good, but they completely failed to notice this vast property bubble. <laughs> bubble. Yes, they, 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 they didn't, they, didn't they, they stopped getting into everybody else's property bubble, but, com but didn't stop one happening, right, their own unique bubble right under their feet, um, which was rather unfortunate. I, I tend to feel I have a bit of a bee in my, my bonnet about regulatory arbitrage as well. I, I, I Again, getting back to the, my general sense of embarrassment sometimes about being British, the uh, the amount I heard um, sitting in New York about how uh, London had this wonderful, superior, light touch regulatory system and that this was a means to, uh, to, uh, to compete. Uh, and the idea of putting statues of Sarbanes and Oxley outside uh, the London Stock Exchange um, is a very embarrassing episode in the, in the financial history of this country, in my opinion. That's not the way to compete, and com competition between jurisdictions tends to end up, or has in recent history, ended up being a, 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 you know, a, 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 a flight to the bottom. We're still seeing it in, in all the arguments going on around Europe, the difficulties we're having in the, the way Basel III is steadily getting ever more lenient uh, as time goes by, uh, has a lot to do with uh, the, uh, the, the jo jockeying between jurisdictions. Uh, I wish it did work in a way where people learned what worked and applied it. Um, but what tends, what seems to happen very unfortunately is that uh, uh, jurisdictions will see somebody being conservative and will try to attract the funds. Um, so I'm not, uh, unfortunately, a, a fan of regulatory competition. John's absolutely right on this lowest common denominator problem. The flip side is, and I think one of the things that worries me most, is when all regulators are using the same tools, mm -hmm. if that tool proves to be wrong, <coughs> they are all wrong at once. And you get a constant, you, you get, the worry I have right now is we're encouraging all banks to look alike and behave alike and mm -hmm. do the same things and go into the same products. And we are creating yes. a systemic risk that is much greater than pre-crisis by virtue of this regulatory framework that encourages them all to look alike. And I think that could be the biggest mistake we've made. Yeah, and, and regulators and bankers alike all did their CFAs and their MBAs and all learned that VAR, model, VAR models and all had this notion that there was a certain amount of value at risk and no more, and they were... All wrong. All wrong. <laughs> and, and the same mistakes on Excel. <laughs> I think the US uh, shows that um, competition in, so among supervisors can be very risky, uh, both actually on the supply and the demand side. So um, kind of the, the, the fun, specific financial institution looking for the most lenient supervisor on the one hand, or uh, just certain institutions ending up on the, the least uh, prepared and competent uh, um, uh, regulator, such as uh, AIG ending up under the insurance uh, regulator of New York State, um, in spite of being the biggest market maker in CDS. Uh, uh, in the CS market. So um, I would say that uh, competition is maybe not the right way to go. Um, I think maybe diversity and accountability is the, the way to go. So uh, uh, checks and balances on supervisors and fostering exactly this diversity of like alternative approaches, um, I think that might be a more helpful way uh, going forward and trying to compete among regulators, uh, which will lead probably to, to a downward spiral. Well, folks, um, I'm going to sadly have to bring this discussion to a close. Uh, I've learned one thing in future. I think I'm only going to take questions from people who wave copies of a book. 
uh, from one of the panelists. You know. <laughs> so David G, thank you for that. And uh, buy John's book as well. It's a very good read. Um, the second thing I'd, I'd like to say is uh, I, I think it, there, were, there were a lot of things we could have gone on about. I, was, I wanted to pursue the separation of maybe the deposit taking. I would, I would just love to have explored many other things, but we sadly don't have time. Um, but there is a chance to mingle and, and all of that. Um, and I would just end on a kind of a, I think the tenor of this was a quote uh, from Winston Churchill. Uh, the panel, I think, was behind innovation, but, uh, but in a kind of a measured way. And Churchill said, we must beware of needless innovation, especially when guided by logic. So I, I'm, I think it's really good to have gotten the emotional tenor of this panel and what, what they feel about it. And I think it was a very balanced view. And I'd like to thank you very much for your contributions. So.